Hey, Jefferson City Christian Church and anybody else who has decided to tune in with us, uh, we are glad that you decided to do that. But before I kind of get into this whole service that we're going to be doing, uh, let me just say today's service is brought to you by COVID-19. It may say 19, but it's the number one excuse to get out of doing things you don't want to do, right? <laughs> we are glad that you have chosen to join us. Now let's talk about today's service. Um, we want this to be a low-key, inspirational uh, maybe encouraging time for you this morning. Uh, we hope that you can just kind of relax, grab a cup of coffee, and uh, get to hear one more of Luke's message in the Bystander series, which has been so good uh, and will continue to be uh, great all the way up through Easter. Um, you're also going to have an opportunity to hear a couple of worship songs, and we encourage you to hum along, sing along. I mean, you can stand and, and, and join us in worship uh, if you'd like to do that right there in your house. A couple of things that I want you to know uh, are that, first of all, if there are those of you who are members of our church that would like to give an offering, you can actually act Access our online giving right down in the description of this video. So you can go and click on that and it will be pretty self-explanatory how that goes. Uh, so let's listen to some songs. Let's hear a message. You'll get some announcements at the end of this and let's take an opportunity this morning or evening or whenever it is you're tuning in uh, to remember our Savior Jesus that we celebrate today. <laughs>
Silence. 
Welcome Jefferson City Christian Church. Well, we are here at our very first streaming service and I'm very happy to be your speaker. Now, um, we, if you didn't know, we're going through a series right now called Bystander uh, and we're going through the book or the gospel of John. Um, and what we're doing is we're doing this because John was an eyewitness to Jesus and his, he was a disciple that, that saw in his scriptures. He said he saw and he heard and he experienced Jesus firsthand. And a lot of times when we think of faith and belief, we think that we, we take these by hope. Uh, John didn't do that. He didn't have faith in Jesus and that, that's not what he led him to believe in Jesus. He actually, um, he actually believed in Jesus because he saw Jesus. He heard Jesus. He experienced Jesus. And so we're walking with him through his gospel uh, because he wants us to also believe that way and understand Jesus that way. Um, so we welcome you to this series, this third week of our series. Uh, if you're uh, visiting with us right now, uh, if you're on this at, for a first time, uh, we are in like an empty room. What would usually be happening right now is I would be walking up and the congregation would be going absolutely nuts. They would be clapping for me uh, and yelling for me. Um, I'm a very funny person, so they laugh at everything I say. Um, and so that's usually how this thing works. Uh, but but again, you should just come and visit and hear it. Uh, they're always saying amen. That's the, that's the thing about it. They always say amen, but we'll, we'll go past that. Um, but we want to welcome you to the, the, to the third week of Bystander. Um, a couple of weeks ago, my wife and I, we went to the movies and we saw a movie called Just Mercy. Um, it's actually a movie adapted from a book by a guy named Brian Stevenson. And he wrote this book as a lawyer, um, he started a uh, nonprofit called the Equal Justice Initiative. And he started this um, because back in 1983, when he was a law student, um, he did some work in the criminal system he would, uh, in, in Atlanta, Georgia, and he would visit uh, inmates in death row as part of his uh, pre-law uh, at this law place in uh, Atlanta. And he would visit these people and he would visit the poor. Uh, at people and the people who were uh, minorities uh, and they were lived in poor communities and what he found through these interviews with these people is that these people were on death row and they were there for not because they couldn't afford legal representation they were too poor to, to, to afford legal representation or they were lived in poor communities and they just couldn't afford the right kind and, and the result was that they were on death row a lot of times unjustly uh, because of just flat out racism and uh, flat out they, they were there for the wrong reasons. And so the book, uh, a lot of uh, the book is about, I'm reading through it right now, is about the, the justice system and how sometimes it's flawed. Uh, but he shares a story with a guy named Walter McMillan, uh, one of his first cases and trying that case. And he talks about uh, that case and, and what went on in that case. Now, um, at the uh, end of the book, and I, I read forward uh, to the end of the book, he, he talks uh, about attending his funeral, and he spoke at his funeral. And I want to read you a quote uh, that he gives us. He said, Mercy is most empowering, liberating, and transformative when it's directed at the undeserving. The people who haven't earned it, who haven't even sought it, are the most meaningful recipients of our compassion. 
You know, compassion is one of those things that, that we hear about in the scriptures. Uh, but a lot of times we hear about times when, uh, and it's really d- disappointing, when people uh, are using their authority, their religious authority in the scriptures, but uh, other times we hear about it, it's maybe in the justice system, but it's disheartening when we hear this, when people use their power or their authority uh, to, to not show someone compassion, to justify not showing someone compassion, to justify not showing someone mercy. And it's very disheartening when we hear these stories. And it's very disheartening when we open our Bible and, and we see these stories going on. And one of the things we see through John's eyes is we see that Jesus hates this kind of thing. He doesn't like it when we use our authority the wrong way. And I would like to say that after Jesus, throughout the history of the church, that we were exempt from this kind of behavior, but we're not. In fact, some of our our darkest times in church history come from times when the church has gained authority and we've used it to be less compassionate, to hurt people, to abuse people even, uh, and, and we've used it poorly. And so um, when we go to the scripture that we're talking about today, uh, John actually is sharing in his Bible uh, or in his gospel uh, miracles of Jesus. And he's taking us through seven miracles of Jesus. He calls them signs. Um, and, but the miracles are really just pointing to Jesus as the Messiah. And, and we're going through these things uh, in our series. Today we're going to talk about the third sign or the third miracle. The first two were at in two very, very different places. The first one was at a wedding, a time of celebration. And the second one was at a time when he met a royal official in a time of desperation. Today, we're going to see a miracle of Jesus. Uh, He does a sign uh, during a time, really, when we see a lot of injustice going on. Um, And so we're going to talk about that for a little bit. So if you have your Bibles or if you're on your Bible app right now, we have a Bible app that you've probably heard about already. Turn with me to John chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. And we're going to read through this uh, together. Some time later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals Now there in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethsaida, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Again, he's being very descriptive here because, after all, he was there. Uh, What you should know about this area, the Sheep Gate, is that it was near the temple. And there was a pool there that ever so often uh, would bubble up. The water would rise and it would bubble up. Now, uh, the theory or the superstition, if you will, was that the reason that it rose up and it bubbled up is because there was an angel that came down and it would stir the water. And as the angel stirred the water with their finger, the water would rise and it would bubble up. Uh, now, the reason I say it's superstition is because later on they excavated this particular area and they found a spring underneath this pool. And the theory, uh, probably what happened was, is the spring would rise and it would bubble up. Uh, but again, uh, what you read next is really disheartening and kind of uh, it makes you feel very sad because it says there a great number of disabled people used to lie. And it talks about who was there, the blind, the lame and the paralyzed. And, and you can know why these people are here now that you know the theory or the, or, or, or the, the reason that they thought they were uh, there uh, was to be healed. These people were the poorest of the poor. They couldn't afford a doctor. And the reason that they were outside the temple is because many of the lame, the blind, and the paralyzed were thought to be sinners. They were thought that they themselves did this to themselves because of their sin or their parents sinned and they were uh, caught their sin in, in, in their womb. And they were desperate, desperate because they were laying around this pool hoping to see the water rise, hoping the water would bubble so they could be pushed in. They believed the first one in was healed. I mean, think about this mass number of people here at this sheep gate waiting to be healed, waiting for the water to rise. It's just a horrifying uh, and kind of a a very sad uh, picture. But Jesus is there, it says, and it said one who was there had been invalid for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there, he learned that he had been in this condition for a long time. So Jesus asked him a question. Now get this. This is the question he asked. Do you want to get well? Yeah. (laughs) 
I mean, think about it. I mean, uh, you, you look at that question and you think, well, yeah, Jesus, that's kind of a dumb question. Of course he wants to get well. That's, that's why he's there. And then you hear his response when he says, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. I, I'm trying to get in, but someone else goes down ahead of me. So you even hear his response. And then you think, well, well, maybe there's something deeper in Jesus's question there. Maybe it makes sense of why he asked that. Jesus was going around that area and he looked at the man and thought, well, maybe the reason that you've been there for 38 years is maybe you have been comfortable there. Maybe you're, you'd rather be there. In fact, maybe you're more comfortable being sick than you are being well. I mean, really, 38 years and in all this time, you, you couldn't get closer to the pool. In all these years, you couldn't get some buddies to, to maybe get you closer there so you could be the first one in. Maybe he was comfortable in his sickness. And so we step out of this, and I want to ask you a question if you're listening to me. Do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? Because let's just be honest. Sometimes we prefer sick because it's, it's comfortable. It's easier. I mean, this man may have preferred sick because every day he got people to give him food. He was taken many places and he knew that if he got well, he would have to do those things himself. But let's be honest, some of us are the same way. Some of us, the reason that we don't want to get well is because we would have to admit that we were sick in the first place. And let's be honest, sometimes that's a real hit to our pride. We would have to be humble enough to say that we're sick. And if we got well, then, then maybe we wouldn't get mom's chicken soup. Or maybe if we got well, we wouldn't be expected to go back to work. And maybe if we got well, we wouldn't get financial help from the people around us. And, and maybe we're scared about that. I mean, let's be honest. Sometimes addiction is more comfortable than the rehab center. Because in addiction, you can drink this and maybe you can take that medication and forget all the pain that drove you to do it in the first place. But if you go to rehab, you actually have to get better and face those things that brought you to that place. And let's be honest, sometimes it's more comfortable to meet with lawyers and, and to go over dividing up our assets than meeting with a counselor to heal the marriage. We would prefer that because that's more comfortable. And, and, and a lot of times we don't face the fact that we need to get well. And, and so Jesus is asking you and he's asking me and he's asking this man, do you want to get well? So then Jesus walks over to the man and he does something in verse eight. He says, get up. Get up and pick your mat up and walk. Now, the, the word get up, if you read that in the Greek language, it was originally written in means arise, rise up. In other places in the scripture, this language is, called, is used as Resurrect or resurrection. I mean, think about that. He tells him to get up and he does. At once the man, it says, was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. Wow, what a scene. And then the next verse, the next verse kind of gives us kind of why Jesus was there that day. Because, again, Jesus could have done this any day, but he chose this day to do it. And, and this next verse tells us why. The day on which this took place was on the Sabbath. That's John 5, 9. It was the Sabbath day. That was the Jewish festival that was going on that day. And so it says, when the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, it's the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. In other words, I told you the temple was close to this place. So this man probably went to the temple and the first thing that he heard was, it's the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. In other words, welcome to church. You're a sinner. Welcome to church. You don't belong here. I mean, think about what this man was thinking at this point. But, but this was not the greeting he probably wanted to have his first time in the temple, possibly in 38 years. But, but this is exactly the problem that occurred because you see that word law. What law did he really break? There were uh, 
two laws that actually that they were referring to when they said the law in the Old Testament. Um, this is the laws that were found uh, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus. Um, if you haven't read that, it's a, it's a fascinating story about how law, Moses took the, the people out of the land of Egypt. But but they were referring to these two tablets that he came down the mountain with. And on one side was called the written law. Now, the written law were, was things that you and I would, would recognize. They were the things written in Genesis and Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, we can read these today. It's called the Torah. It's, it's in the first five books of the Bible. Uh, but what they were referring to actually was something called the oral law. Now, in Moses' other hand, uh, they, it was said that he had other things written down. But those things weren't written down for us to read. They were to be written down and orally interpreted. And they were passed down to the prophets and to the kings and eventually made themselves, or they claimed that they made them to the, the Pharisees. And so the law that they were referring to was a law and the written law, uh, uh, the one that you and I would recognize, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. I mean, that's like a, a Ten Commandment thing, right? But, but the law that he broke was actually not that law. They were referring to uh, the oral law. Now, that particular law had 39 different subcategories on how to follow that written law. Uh, and the one that they were referring to was one that kind of went like this. So you can't carry things from one place to another or it's considered work and you have broken, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. So it was this oral law that they were referring to and calling him a sinner because, again, it carried equal weight as the written law. Now, <laughs> I want you to think about this. This is, is what happens. I mean, think about it. They were more concerned with following this law than really trying to find out what Jesus wanted us to, to understand about this law in the first place. But this... This happened all the time, and these things happen when theological systems and religion are more important than protecting the people that the theological systems and religion were there to help. I mean, what they didn't realize is the reason that, that the Sabbath day was there was there to help people. I mean, the Sabbath day was never meant to be a day of judgment. It was actually meant to be a day of, of rest. It was to remind us that we're not robots, that we need to rest, that we, we need to rejuvenate, that we need to spend time with God. That's why that law was written. It was there to help us remember that, not to be a day of judgment, not to be a day to remind it that we're breaking some other law. And they had totally twisted it and made this man a sinner, someone that couldn't be a part of God. They did this over and over again. But again, you and I have to be challenged here because we have to be very careful as Christians that we do not use our theological systems or our religion to hurt people, to bring them farther from God, to mistreat someone, to justify not being merciful, not being compassionate. We have to be so careful how we read the scriptures. And if it doesn't lead to get this, I, I, I got this quote from Andy Stanley. It's great. It says, when what is best for the people around you is no longer what's most important to you, you are at odds with God. That's both beautiful to me, but also terrifying because I have to double check myself and, and I have to realize that if my brand of Christianity or if my understanding of God is not meant to bring people closer to God, is not meant to be compassionate to other people, especially the people like the people at the sheep gate, the poor, the desperate, the people who, who are considered sinners. Again, we know that we're all sinners, but God's law, God's, God's law is meant to bring us closer to Him. God's word is meant to, to be for us, not against us, to bring us into a relationship with Him. In fact, in the New Testament, Jesus was asked the two greatest commandments. And Jesus said this, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. But then he, he added something that I think made everyone that heard him that day that he was asked this question do a double take. He said, it, and the second is equal to the first. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law can be summed up into these two commands. And so people really got on board with the first one. But when they heard Jesus say, wait, wait love your neighbor, that made them ask some questions. Wait, well, who's my neighbor? I know the Jews are my neighbor, but are the Samaritans my neighbor? 
I mean, are, are the people that I, I'm not like, the people who aren't Jewish, are they my neighbor? And, and let's say someone does something to me and I have to forgive them. Well, there's a certain amount of time by the law that I have to forgive them. Uh, but how, how, how many times do I have to forgive them, Jesus? Do I have to forgive them once, twice, three times? Uh, how many times? And they were sitting there trying to look at the law, look for loopholes to be unmerciful, uncompassionate, to justify judging someone. Just tell me, Jesus, what do I have to do? And Jesus was like, no, 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 you don't understand. Your neighbor is everyone. Your neighbor is the poor. It's the people who are sinners that need to be closer to me. It's everyone. You have to love everyone. And listen, if, if every class we teach here in our church, everything that we memorize, everything that we study doesn't lead us to leave this church and be more compassionate, more merciful, to bring people who do not know Jesus closer to Jesus. If that doesn't uh, lead, uh, take you somewhere or lead you somewhere, uh, when you memorize these things, if we don't encourage that, we failed you as teachers, as pastors, because that's the end game to love God, certainly to memorize his word, but also to bring our brothers and sisters whom God also loves closer to him. We need to love our neighbors and people are wait, 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 are you are you serious? So what does this look like? And so Paul goes a step further. There's a, an apostle, one of Jesus's apostles, one of God's apostles, Paul. He, he writes to a church in Galatians. He says, well, let me just tell you what it looks like. And he he sums it up in Galatians five. He says, well, it, it's kind of like a fruit. He said it's the fruit of the spirit. It's love and it's joy and it's peace and it's it's patience. It's kindness. It's goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and it's self-control. If you really want to know what uh, the Christian life is meant to bring about, it, it's all of these things. And you start looking at those things. He ends this with this words, with these words. Against such things, there is no law. That's pretty powerful. In other words, there's, there's no law against being too kind. There's no law against being too patient with somebody. In fact, your love, your kindness, um, uh, your gentleness is going to bring someone closer to me. If you get angry at somebody and, and you don't use it to, to be hateful to them or to be mean to them, but you're self-controlled, uh, you know what? You're, you're showing them Christ. And he says, that's going to bring love and joy. And that's going to bring peace. It's not going to bring hatred. It's not going to bring anger. It's not going to bring war. Those are opposite. That's what it's not going to bring injustice. And so we read these things. And here's what I want to tell you. When we follow the law of love, everyone is willing to give Jesus and his church a chance. Because the law is for everyone, because loving your neighbor is everyone. When we follow this law, this Jesus's law of love, everyone is willing to give Jesus and his church a chance. And in the end, this is what this man's response to the Pharisees was. He said, well, he replied, the man who made me well, he said to me, pick up your mat and walk, though. So I'm going to go with him. In other words, listen, it's been 38 years and you've walked past me every day walking to the temple. I show up after 38 years and you're calling me a sinner. If it is between following you and your laws, I'm going to follow the guy who made me well. I'm going to follow the guy who looked at me and asked me a really tough question, but, but made me well, that healed me. That's the guy I'm going to give a chance. That's the guy I want to follow. And I, I believe that's the response we're going to get with people when we show them all of these things like kindness and gentleness and patience. They're going to look at that and, and they're going to respond with, you know what, maybe if that's the way you treat me, if you're treating me in the name of Jesus that way, Maybe I'll give Jesus and his church a chance to. Now, I've been very challenging to the people who are believers, but I want to end this uh, message with another question because um, we do see that Jesus had one more interaction with this man after this. It's in John chapter 5, verse 14. It says, later Jesus found him at the temple. And he said, see, you are well again. And then he says something very interesting. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. You know, Jesus healed him physically, but he didn't just want to heal him physically. He wanted to heal him spiritually as well. And 
The thing that separated him still from, from God was not his physical illness. It was his sin. And Jesus was almost challenging him a second time. Do you want to get well? Because let's be honest, some of us prefer sin because it's more comfortable. Some of us prefer the wrong things that we do because sin is, well, let's just be honest, sin is sometimes fun. Uh, there was a pastor, Craig Groeschel at Life Church TV, that says, you know, um, if your sin isn't fun, then you're probably doing it wrong. And although it's kind of uh, funny to hear something like that, I think a lot of times if you remember back in, in your days or maybe you're experiencing that right now, we're, we're not always having the worst time when we're sinning. And, and sometimes it gets to the point where we're so comfortable with it, we prefer it over getting well. And when Jesus challenges us, says, listen, I, I love you for who you are. I accept you for who you are. In other words, this, this man, he accepted him in his paralyzed state, but he healed him physically. But he also wanted to heal him spiritually. And he said, listen, do you want to get well spiritually? Are you ready to take that next step? So if you're listening today and, and maybe you realize that, you know, maybe I am comfortable in my sin. Maybe I am comfortable apart from God. And I've been there too long. But I'm, I'm, I'm listening to the thing Jesus said. I realize that Jesus is not against me. His laws were never meant to, to be against me. They're actually for me. I want to invite you to this question. It's a hard question. Do you want to get well? Do you want to get well spiritually? So I want to pray right now for both the church and for you. Father, we come to you now and we pray that, um, that we would never use, Father, your word against people to show them less mercy, to, lo to show them less compassion. Father, we, we pray that our, our experience and our life with you brings people closer to you, that brings us into loving relationships with people in our community, in our homes, in our jobs. Father, that we would never use it as a tool to hurt. Father, give us the heart for the people in our lives that are, are poor, that are desperate, and definitely give us a heart for the people who are not with you, not close to you. Father, I also pray for people who aren't close to you right now that maybe are comfortable in their sin. Father, I pray that they would hear you, that you are, are desperately in love with them, that you care about them, that, Father, you want them to know this. But, Father, it takes them uh, accepting you, loving you, and, Father, giving you their lives. And sometimes that's a very hard thing to do. So I pray for their hearts and that they would be softened to your love. It's in your son's name. Amen.